There are a number of diagnostic criteria for both ME and chronic fatigue syndrome. For ME, we have Dr. Melvin Ramsey's original description of the illness. We have some criteria called the London criteria. We have international criteria, newly um, prepared criteria for ME. For CFS, we have a range of criteria again. We have Fukuda criteria, we have Australian criteria, um, we have Oxford criteria here in the UK, and we also have NICE criteria in the UK. And for both ME and CFS, these criteria have similarities and differences, and even within the criteria for ME and CFS, there are similarities and differences. So this is a uh, a picture of great confusion for the average general physician who is presented with a patient in his consulting room who just wants to make a simple straightforward diagnosis on this illness. So I think most of my colleagues, uh, just like uh, the approach I would take, um, takes a pragmatic view to diagnosing this illness. And we make use of these criteria, which are, I have to say, primarily there for research purposes to identify people going into research rather than clinical purposes. So we make use of these criteria, but we don't stick to them rigidly when we make a diagnosis of this illness. To make a diagnosis of ME or CFS or ME-CFS, um, it, it is the same process that you go through when you're making a diagnosis of any illness. You take a history, you examine the patient, and you arrange some blood tests, which we, we will come to shortly. Um, as far as the initial part of the, the clinical consultation is concerned, it is extremely important to take a detailed history from patients with uh, a possible diagnosis of ME, because there are many other illnesses which can overlap with this illness and cause diagnostic confusion. So the, the history taking is extremely important and if there are other um, symptoms there in the history which are not typical of ME they need to be pursued um, to make sure that you're not missing some other diagnosis. It's terribly important to examine the patients carefully, particularly their, their nervous system and muscle, although on the whole you're not going to find any particular diagnostic uh, examination abnormalities which are characteristic of this illness. You may find problems with balance, you may find problems with, with muscle weakness, you may find um, abnormalities in, in some parts of the nervous system examination. But on the whole, examination doesn't add an awful lot to the diagnosis of this illness. When you're considering a diagnosis of ME, it's terribly important to um, check through a quite comprehensive range of blood tests and some urine tests. Um, these tests are done not to diagnose ME, because we don't have a diagnostic blood test for ME, but they are there to make sure that you're not missing other conditions. So you want to check thyroid function, you want to check liver function, kidney function, um, routine hemological checks, um, checks of inflammation or, or, or infection in the body, a, a very uh, sort of wide-ranging test is what's called the ESR. And this list of tests is available, readily available, in all the sort of guidelines that are issued to doctors who are making a diagnosis of ME. They're comprehensively described in the MEA um, booklet on, on diagnosis. Um, so those are tests which have to come back as normal before you should be making a diagnosis of ME. Now, there are also a range of what we would call second line tests, which range from brain scans to immune function tests of the blood to something like even muscle biopsies. Now, you cannot um, arrange to do every single one of these tests in every patient who comes along um, for this, this uh, possible diagnosis. It's not feasible, it's not workable, it's just not costable. So with these second line tests you have to reserve uh, which ones you're going to do on the basis of clinical judgment and this will, base, this will be based on whether or not there are symptoms which we might describe as red flag symptoms. Say you, you've got a patient who is losing weight, well that would in, immediately suggest that you need to be looking to do further investigations before making a diagnosis of ME. Or they have unusual symptoms, perhaps they have skin itch, skin irritation, suggesting that they have a condition called primary biliary cirrhosis that can overlap um, with ME. 
um, or they may have dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, joint pains, suggesting that they may have Sjogren's syndrome, in which you would want to go off and do specific immunological tests, anti autoantibody tests. They may have symptoms which are overlapping with multiple sclerosis, which can occur, and sometimes it's quite difficult to differentiate between ME and, e and MS. And in that case, you want to go off and, and do brain scans or whatever um, to look at for a possible diagnosis of ME. So um, there are a lot of different tests which may be applicable, but in certain circumstances and using your clinical judgment as a doctor, those, that's the situation when you would go off and do those sort of tests. Before a diagnosis of this illness is confirmed, as I was saying when we were talking about taking a very careful clinical history from patients, um, it, it is important to have the back of your mind as a doctor that there are a large number of conditions, we list about 50 different conditions in the, in the MEA booklet on this, that can be misdiagnosed as ME because the symptoms overlap. So when you're going through this history, you need to be aware and pick out symptoms which are not quite consistent with the diagnosis of ME and then start querying, could that be another condition? Um, let's take a, a couple of examples. You have a patient who comes along who has their fatigue, uh, but also has a lot of um, bowel problems as well, irritable bowel type symptomatology. Now we know that irritable bowel type symptomatology, bloating, alternating constipation and diarrhea, stomach pains, um, is quite a common accompaniment to ME. A lot of patients with ME do have this and it's quite tempting to just say, well, you've got ME and you've got a bit of irritable bowel syndrome. But when you have a patient like that who comes along, what should be going through your mind as a doctor is, could this patient also have something like adult onset celiac disease? Um, which is not uncommon in the adult population, which is treatable to a large degree um, and can be misdiagnosed as ME. So you get a patient with fatigue, irritable bowel type symptoms, you should be doing a screening test to rule out celiac disease at the same time. Another example might be you get a patient with fatigue and joint pain and we have a condition called joint hypermobility syndrome which can overlap with ME. And again, it, the, there would be a different form of management if you had someone with joint hypermobility syndrome. Interesting thing about joint hypermobility syndrome is that these patients often have bruising as well. So that would be another, another warning sign there. So there's a lot of different conditions which need to be seriously considered um, before you come to this diagnosis and say you've definitely got ME. The diagnosis of ME in most cases, I would stress most cases, is something that should be um, capable of being made by a good general practitioner, that's a doctor in primary care. Um, where a doctor in primary care uh, is unable to make a diagnosis, then there should be facilities available at the local hospital, either through an MECFS clinic or a specialist at the local hospital who has widespread experience of dealing with this illness, to whom a patient should be able to be referred for a confirmation of the diagnosis. The international criteria is the latest and most comprehensive criteria which is aimed to be able to help doctors make a diagnosis of ME. Um, it is a very detailed criteria and as I've indicated earlier, I think most of my medical colleagues take a very pragmatic approach to making a diagnosis of this illness and don't tend to sit there with a the diagnostic criteria, especially if it is long and complicated, um, sitting on their consulting room table. So I think as an aid to diagnosis, um, this is a very helpful document. But I think to expect that every doctor is going to sit there with this criteria in his waiting room, uh, consulting room, and then using it to make a diagnosis of ME is probably unrealistic at this point.
Heeft u een vraag naar aanleiding van deze video? Reageer op YouTube of tweet naar het MECVS Vereniging. Of mail naar wvp.me-cvsvereniging.nl De beste vragen worden in een volgende video behandeld.